Well, amen. Take your Bibles, if you would. Turn to 2 Samuel 19. We're going to conclude our series that we've entitled Legacy, Lessons from the Life of Absalom. The songs that were selected for this morning couldn't have gone any better with the message that's going to be brought. Uh, it was almost like uh, Rick and I got together and planned that. We did not. But uh, yes, somebody was obviously in charge of making that all work out. You know, when we talk about giving God the glory, of course, you know, God is glorious, right? We can't make him any more glorious, but when we are encouraged to give him the glory in our lives, it means that we're to live in such a way that others see God in us. We're to, we're to praise God with our lives, whether we're going through big stuff, bad stuff, uh, whatever stuff it may be that we are going through, we are to be a, a people who praise the Lord through it all. I mean, when you think about what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ, it's, it's, it's really overwhelming. And, and it's overwhelmingly glorious and good uh, that God would love us, sinners, all right, enough to send His Son into the world to die for us on the cross so that our sin could be taken away. We can be clothed in His righteousness. You know, when God looks at you, Christians now, He looks at you through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. He looks at you as one who is righteous. Matter of fact, He has declared you righteous. The judge of all the universe has said, that's one of my righteous ones. And because He has done that for you, you now have access to Him continually. You can go to him in prayer. You can voice your complaints or your praise. You can let your needs be known. It's a wonderful thing to think that as Christians, we now have access to Almighty God, the throne of grace. And not only that, but not only has he clothed you, you know, all that kind of outward talk, clothed us in the righteousness of Christ, but he's given us a new heart. He's done something inwardly as well. So not only are we now, because of the righteousness of Christ, able to enter into the presence of God, but because of the new heart that Christ has given us, God can now enter into us. He lives within us. That's a wonderful thing. It ought to, it ought to cause us to, to, to be so encouraged and so comforted that the God, through the person of the Holy Spirit, has chosen to live within us, to indwell us, to guide us into all truth, uh, to, to convict us when we sin or when we're even thinking about sin. Such a wonderful thing that God has done for us to take away our sin, to make us his own. Christ paid the price for all of that on the cross, right? He, he drank the cup of God's wrath to the very dregs. And so you know what? We don't have to. That ought, to make us, that ought to make us very, very happy people. I think sometimes, as Christians, we get so caught up in all the stuff that's going on in our lives and in the world that we, we forget just how happy we should be, just how blessed we are, and just how that should cause us to live uh, for the glory of our God. Uh, Throughout this series, though we haven't emphasized it, and really it's true of all uh, the, the biblical writings of, of David, David is one of those Old Testament types of Christ, right? In him, we see a shadow of, of, of the Lord Jesus and what he would ultimately do for us in reality. So, so David simply represents this type of Christ. He's God's anointed king, right? Right? He is the rightful one to sit upon the throne of the nation of Israel. So even his rule over Israel, though it was far from perfect, it, it typifies the reign of Christ over the kingdom of God, which of course is perfectly perfect. Uh, so as we conclude this series of lessons this morning, we're going to really see some gospel lessons this morning. You know, if you read the way you should read, you'll find the gospel of Jesus Christ in the pages of the Old Testament. It, it all points to him. Uh, and of course, this text that we're going to look at today, <clears throat> as every text we look at in the Old Testament, points 
to Jesus. And so the lessons that we need to learn this morning, really the lessons that everyone needs to learn and to accept, it's not just learning these things, it's accepting them, it's embracing them, it's trusting in them, it's, it's committing our lives to the truth of what we are learning, all right? That's, that's what living for Jesus is all about. That's what being a Christian is all about. I, uh, I heard a long time ago that there was a Bible translator uh, who was a, a missionary, so to speak, a, a minister that worked with Tyndale, uh, who goes throughout the world, and they send people into areas where there is no Bible in the language of the people, and they spend years translating scripture into the language of these people so that they can have the Bible in their own language. And, of course, this missionary got to John 3.16, and he was trying to figure out what the best word would be for that word in the New Testament, believe. Uh, All who believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, a critical verse, right? And he's walking through the jungle thinking, praying, God, what word, what word in these people's language best conveys this idea of believing in Jesus? And he happened to pass this man who was taking a nap in a hammock, and the hammock was strung between two trees, and it was really kind of high off the ground, and the guy thought, wow, you know, that's, that takes a lot of faith to climb up into that thing and to trust that it's going to hold you, hold you, not let you fall. And it dawned on him, and he asked, he said, what word in your language, what, what word would convey you casting your full weight into that hammock, trusting it to, to hold you and not let you fall? And that was the word that he used to translate the word believe. And that's what we're called on to do. To believe in Jesus Christ means to trust him implicitly, to, to put our whole weight upon him, to, to trust that he will indeed save us. He will keep us from falling. Uh, that's what it means to believe. And I'll tell you what, church, when you, when you come to the place in your life when you really believe that, it'll show on the outside. It'll, it'll cause you to, to smile and to rejoice and, and to be happy Christians. So the lessons that we're going to learn this morning are lessons about how to live this abundant, happy, hope-filled life that God intends for us to live. I'm convinced. Too, too many too many professing Christians go through life, well, way too sad, uh, as if God really hadn't done all that much for us. Uh, maybe one day, when Christ returns, when I die, when I get to go to heaven, things will be better then, but you know, things are rough now, and, and I know that times are tough, but you know what? God is good, and it should show in our lives. Well, I'm going to read kind of the first part of our text today. I'm going to begin in verse 19, or in verse 1 of chapter 19. I'm going to read down, uh, we'll read down through verse 8, and then we'll take a look at this. The Bible says, It was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. Now, you remember last week, David and Really, the mighty men of David, the army of David, had, had, had defeated Absalom, the army of Israel, uh, there in that forest that had devoured so many of them. Uh, and yet Absalom uh, was killed in that battle, and David learns of his son's death, and he takes it hard, as we would understand. Uh, even says that last verse in chapter 18, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I have died instead of you? David, I believe, truly wishes that he could have died in the place of his son. Uh, So he weeps and sorrows. So Joab hears that that's indeed what what is happening. The king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard that day the king is grieving for his son. And the people stole into the city that day as people steal in who are ashamed when they flee in battle. The king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O my son Absalom, O Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab came into the house of the king and said, You have today covered with shame the faces of all your servants who have this day saved your life. 
and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and your concubines because you love those who hate you and you hate those who love you. For you have made it clear today that commanders and servants are nothing to you. For today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now therefore rise, go out and speak kindly to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go, not a man will stay with you this night. And this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. Then the king arose, took his seat at the gate, and the people were told, Behold, the king is seated, sitting at the gate, and all the people came before the king. Let's, let's stop there. Let me pray, and then we're going we're gonna to talk about what rebellion does. Father, we are so thankful today uh, for your grace, for your mercy. Thankful, Father, for salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. Thankful for one who came, died in our place, took away our sin, satisfied your wrath, and now is seated at your right hand on the throne where he ever lives, forever lives, to be our intercessor, our intercession. Father, he is the one who, who prays for us. He is the one who gives us access to you in prayer. Lord, uh, he is the reason that we should live lives of abundant joy and happiness. So we thank you for him. And we pray, Father, that you would speak to our hearts today concerning sin and, and rebellion and, and, and the result of these things as depicted here in this text, and we'll give you a praise and thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Absalom had rebelled against his father, and in essence, of course, he rebelled against God himself because David was the man after God's heart. David, as we said, was the anointed king of Israel. He was God's choice to sit on the throne of Israel, to lead the people of Israel. And so Absalom's rebellion against his father was in truth a rebellion against God himself. And let me just say this. Any rebellion, all right, is rebellion against God. When we disobey, when we willingly violate the, the, the commands of God, the word of God, we stand in rebellion against God. It is a, it is a truth. And, of course, uh, all of us have at one time in our lives done that. And so rebellion ultimately leads to the kind of sorrow that we are seeing here in our text, Proverbs 10.1 says this, A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. And of course, we are uh, certain Absalom was not uh, a wise son. And so his foolish rebellion grieved the heart of his father. Uh, I believe David had to realize that justice had been done when Joab killed Absalom. I mean, Joab, or Absalom, had raised an army, had, had stolen the hearts of, of David's people, of the Lord's people, uh, had uh, sought to take the life of his own father in order to usurp the throne. David had to realize at some part of his experience that that was justice for, for Joab to have killed Absalom. But nonetheless, Absalom was his son. It broke David's Heart, You know, I think sometimes, and we love to talk about the sovereignty of God, right? The sovereignty of God and salvation. We know that, that it's God who saves. Uh, but the Bible tells us, Peter tells us, that God is patient. That he is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, we should never forget that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is a loving heavenly father. We should never think that uh, he is anything other than that. But nonetheless, this rebellion, this rebellious son had brought sorrow, deep sorrow, not only to David as is being evidenced here, but, but to the entire nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was mourning. Uh, David was mourning. Now, there were those who should have been rejoicing, as we are told here. Uh, those who had followed David into battle and who had defeated Absalom and his army, they wanted to rejoice. They had won the victory. And yet David's very public grieving over Absalom uh, 
cause them to, to slink away in shame, the Bible says. Even as those who have, who have abandoned the fight have, 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 have left the battlefield in shame, that, that's how they, they slipped home, uh, and they should have been able to return home rejoicing. Uh, sin brings sorrow, right? I think we... We enter into sin because we think it's going to bring us joy. Uh, Sin promises to make us happy, but it doesn't, at least not for long. Uh, And this is pictured here in this account of David's weeping over the loss of his rebellious son. Justice had indeed been done. God was the one who had determined to bring harm to Absalom, right? That was God's plan. Uh, Joab just became the means by which God's plan was was carried out. And though we understand David's sorrow, uh, we can also understand the humiliation and the shame that came to his followers because of his behavior. And of course, Joab confronts him with that. He says, today you've covered with shame the faces of all your servants. Again, David didn't hide his grief. Uh, and he, and he carried on in his grief for, for a long, long time. And uh, though, again, it is understandable, it was misguided. It humiliated his faithful followers, causing them to feel ashamed of their victory rather than to rejoice in their victory. And so what I want to point out here for just a moment is this. The Bible clearly teaches that there is a right and a wrong way to sorrow. And and let me just say this right up front, again, kind of as a broad principle here. If you are sorrowing today because you just don't think God has given you everything you deserve, then you need to repent. God has given you everything you need to live a life of godliness. God has blessed you. Again, we kind of laid out some of the things that God has done for us, right? Our, Our sins have been taken away. That alone ought to cause us to to rejoice. to live as happy people every day knowing that my sin is forgiven. It has been taken away. The psalmist said, remove from me as far as the east is from the west. God will not deal with us according to our sin because he dealt with his son Jesus. His wrath was poured out on him. And so therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that's cause for rejoicing. That ought to lead to happiness in our lives. And yet, in my experience, I've found that many Christians live lives characterized by guilt and shame. Is that you? You know, maybe there's something in your past, or maybe there's something in your recent past. You know you shouldn't have done it. You wish you'd never done it. But you know, when Christ died for you on the cross, took away your sin, not only did he do that, but he, the Bible says he purified your conscience. See, that's, the, old, the old covenant sacrifices couldn't do that. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't do that. Uh, they were temporary. They, were, they partially atoned for the sins of the people. They had to be repeated over and over and over again, but not so with Christ. He came and offered his own blood once and for all. Again, clothing you in his righteousness, giving you a new heart, purifying your conscience. We're not to walk around with guilt and shame. I mean, that causes sorrow, right? It causes us to grieve. David's grieving overflowed to the humiliation of his faithful followers. You know, 2 Corinthians 7.10 says this, Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Now, and let me just ask you, godly sorrow produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. But worldly grief produces death. There is a proper way to grieve, even to grieve over sin. Our sorrow should be a godly sorrow, a sorrow that is a, 
is a very temporary sorrow that leads to repentance, a turning from that sin that has brought the sorrow into our lives that ultimately brings glory to God and eliminates any regret that we might have in our lives. And again, I'm convinced Christians all over the world live with regret. We shouldn't. We shouldn't. That kind of grief, the Bible says, produces death. Paul, as he sought to encourage the Thessalonians, said that they were not to grieve as others who have no hope. The reality is, for Christians, Christ in us, right? The hope of glory. We have this great hope, this, this certainty that Christ is going to return. This whole chapter is leading up to the return of the king. David is going to return and to take his rightful seat upon the throne of Israel. Let me tell you, God made us a promise too, right? Jesus promised in John 14. I'm going away for a little while, but I'm going to come back. And When I do, I'm going to receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also. So don't let your hearts be troubled. My father's house is a wonderful place, lots of places to live there. And one day I'm going to come take you home with me. You'll be welcomed into to heaven, into the family of God. We are not to grieve or to sorrow as those who have no hope. So Joab comes, he confronts David with the truth. You've covered with shame the faces of all your servants. They, they laid down their lives for you today, he says. They saved your life, the lives of your sons and your daughters. But you act as if you love those who hate you, hate those who love you. I mean, he even goes so far to say, if we were all dead and Absalom was alive, you'd be happy about that. What a terrible thing for the king to hear. So he tells him, you need to get up and you need to go out. You need to stop all of this crying and go speak kindly to your servants. And of course, David does that, and what an encouragement it must have been for all of those who had followed him on that flight from Jerusalem and now through that victorious battle on their way home. Rebellion against the king brings sorrow and shame, but there is a right way to sorrow, a right way to repent. And of course, the Bible teaches that all of us have sinned, right? Right? We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us must come to the place in our own lives where we recognize our sin and are willing to acknowledge it. Have you done that? Has there come a time in your life when you, when you have seen yourself as someone who has sinned? You know, I had a conversation years ago with a guy who was attending our church. And he began talking to me about his life, and he told me that he'd made a profession of faith in Christ when he was in high school. He'd been baptized, he joined the church, and then he began to talk about what his life had been like since then. Let me tell you, there was no joy in this guy's heart. There was no happiness. Uh, he talked about the way that he had lived, the things that he had done, the things that he enjoyed doing, and uh, he, he wouldn't even look at me. He had a ball cap on, and his head was down, and I mean, I couldn't even see his face as we sat there and talked. And finally, when he got through, I just said, well, you know, I said, the life you're describing sounds much like my life before I came to know Christ. And at that point, he looked up at me with a tear rolling down his cheek. And he said, I've known it all along. He said, I've, I've known I've, I'm not saved. I'm not saved. I've never really trusted Jesus. I've, I've never repented of my sin. I've never turned from it and received Christ. And he prayed that day to do just that. And it made all the difference. When God saves us, it changes everything. We are not supposed to be the same person that we were before we knew Christ. The Bible says that we are new creatures in Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And the new man that we are in Christ is a, is a forgiven, saved happy, God-glorifying man. Well, next we see people beginning to recognize that they had made a mistake. 
David is sitting in the gate. All the people came before the king. We'll pick up there in in verse 8. Now, Israel had fled every man to his own house, and all the people were arguing. So these were the the Israelites who had rebelled against David with Absalom, all right? They had all fled back to their homes. They were arguing, it says, throughout all the tribes of Israel. And they were arguing about whether or not to allow David to come back and take his seat upon the throne. And they said... The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philippines or the Philistines. And now he has, he has fled out of uh, the land from Absalom, but Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? Uh, this light bulb began to go off. We've made a horrible mistake. We've rebelled against the man that saved us from our enemies. We've followed a usurper to the throne who is now dead in battle. They were coming to their senses. You remember the story of the prodigal son, right? Came to his father, said, I want my inheritance now. And the dad gave it to him and he went to a far country and he squandered it on riotous living, the scripture says. And he wound up broke, friendless. He had to uh, get a job uh, tending to another man's pigs. And there in the pigsty, the Bible says, he came to himself. And he said, you know what, I'm going to get up and go home. Even the servants in my father's house have it better than this. Uh, they have plenty to eat. I'm, I'm so hungry, I'm, I, I'm, I'm about to eat this pig food. And that's exactly what he did. He got up and he went home. He came to his senses. Israel began to come to its senses. The, the king has delivered us. This, this David that we rebelled against, he's the one that delivered us from the hands of of our enemies. He's the one that saved us. You see how David typifies Christ in this story? David was clearly the king that the people needed. Again, he was God's choice for king. He was God's anointed king. He had sacrificed his life. He had had proven by this sacrificial service to Israel that he was the man that, that rightfully belonged on the throne. And isn't that what Jesus has done for us? Jesus came and lived a sinless life, right? He loved us. He served us. He taught us. He healed us. He cast out demons. He lived this wonderful life and then ultimately died for us on the cross. Rose again to the glory of God the Father. David was the sensible choice for the people of Israel. Let me tell you, Jesus is the sensible choice for you. You know, we get it in our heads sometimes that we can handle things on our own. There are people all over the world that believe they can save themselves. That their idea or their way to heaven is as good as any way the Bible declares. Let me tell you, that's just not the case. Jesus is the one who loved us, who died for us, who rose again to save us. Jesus is the sensible choice. If you're looking for a a Savior, He's the only choice. Ultimately, you know, there's going to be a universal recognition of Jesus as Savior and King, right? That's what the Bible teaches. Philippians 2, 10 and 11 <clears throat> speaks of that day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And, and it's every knee in heaven, every knee on earth, every knee under the earth, everywhere. There will be a universal acknowledgement, a universal recognition of Jesus as King. The sad reality will be that day that there will be those who praise his return, who bow before him, having longed and loved his return, who are saved. And then there will be those who grudgingly will acknowledge him as Savior, as King. But they will be lost. 
Have you trusted Christ Jesus as Savior and Lord? Are you trusting him even today? It's the sensible thing to do. I mean, have you ever thought about it? Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody? And they just look at you like they don't get it. I mean, you've told them, if you'll, if you'll repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ, he'll forgive you of your sin. He'll make you a child of God. He'll clothe you in his righteousness. He'll prepare a place for you in heaven, at the table of God, in the, in the household of God. You'll live forever on a new earth and a resurrected body. I mean, it couldn't be any better than that. But they're just not interested. Doesn't make sense, does it? Repent of your sin. Receive Christ Jesus as Savior. That's the sensible thing to do. And then, of course, with that recognition of Jesus as Savior and King, recognition of David as the rightful king, then there there is now a submission on the part of the people. They had rebelled against David. And now they were once again contemplating submitting their lives to him, the rightful king. Why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? David was going to return to the throne, but here's what's interesting about this. David didn't immediately make the trip back into Jerusalem, did he? He stopped at the Jordan River. David wasn't going to return to the throne forcibly. He was going to return by the consent of the people. The very people who had rebelled against him He wanted to know that they were now with him. And so he begins this conversation. The people of God would have to willingly acknowledge their rightful king and receive him into their lives to rule over them. And again, the same thing is true of us. When we acknowledge Christ as Savior and Lord, receive him as Savior and Lord of our lives, then we live lives of submission to him, Uh, obedient lives. So, not only must we recognize our sin and repent of it, but we must acknowledge Jesus Christ as our only hope of salvation and then receive him as Savior and Lord and live to serve him the rest of our lives and really the rest of eternity. Did you know on that new earth that we talked about a moment ago, You're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ even on the new earth. We're going to continue to serve him throughout all eternity. It is the most significant service that any human being can render. You ever think about your life? Think of it as being little, meaningless, insignificant. Let me tell you, if you're a child of the king, if you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ in whatever capacity that is, there is nothing more significant than that. So they acknowledged David as king. They recognized him. They brought him back. And as a result of that, there was reconciliation with the king. Again, those who had rebelled were reconciled. Those who were at one point enemies with God, with with God's king, were now reconciled. There was peace between them. And that's what happens between us and God, right? When Christ Jesus reconciles us to the Father, that's what, that's what he does. It's hard for us to think of ourselves as enemies of God, but that's what we were. But when we receive Christ, we're reconciled with God. No longer enemies, but children, saints. All the people, it says, came before the king as he sat there at the gate The first ones that were reconciled to him were were his servants, the ones who had followed him into battle, who had not rebelled against him. But again, his misguided mourning over his son Absalom had caused them to be clothed with shame and humiliation. But now he did what he should have done. He came, he spoke kindly, and they were reconciled to him. They had faithfully followed him, though they had been humiliated, and now they were once again reconciled to this king that they loved. But not only them... And, and, you know, when we talk about rebellion, we would love to think that our relationships with our fellow Christians are just perfect, right? That we never have a wrong thought or we never say a wrong word, we never offend one another, we never hurt one another's feelings, but we know that's not true, right? But one day, there'll be no more of that. 
And really, there shouldn't be any of it now. We get so upset about such small, insignificant things. Christ died to reconcile us to the Father. And if I've been reconciled to God, then there is no reason in the world that I can't be reconciled to you, my brother or sister. So the servants of David were reconciled to him. But not only them, but all that had rebelled against him. The sinners were reconciled as well. All Israel has come to the king, the Bible says. So those who had proven themselves enemies of the king would be reconciled to him as well. They would acknowledge him as their true king. And they would submit their lives to him in service to the nation. And that's what God has called us to do. As we acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we submit ourselves to his rule to serve him as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So this historical account of the return of David to the throne is really just a gospel message for us. When we turn from sin and repentance and receive Jesus Christ as Savior and King, we are immediately reconciled, brought back into a right relationship with God, and our lives are made fit to live with Him forever in His eternal kingdom. And so once again, I'll just ask you, have you done that? Have you seen yourself as a sinner, turned from that sin in repentance and trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? And if you haven't, there's still time. But Christ is going to come back. One day it'll be too late. But today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. So if you've not done so, come this morning and trust Christ as Savior and Lord. Live in fellowship and service to Him for the rest of your life and all through eternity.